Our next speaker uh, is coming to us from San Francisco. Chris Rogers brings 30 years of mobile industry experience as a founder, advisor, and operator. He's going to be talking to us about trends in emerging market venture ecosystems. He's a partner at Lumia Capital, where he's responsible for leading Lumia's investments in emerging markets like Pakistan. Prior to Lumia, he was co-founder of Nextel Communications, which he grew to $13 billion in sales with 19,000 employees before it was acquired by Sprint for $35 billion. Welcome, Chris Rogers. Round of applause. Hello, everyone. Um, let's see, I'm going to ask a couple of questions. Who was here last year? Well, not that many. Who are entrepreneurs? Okay, so I say this at every panel, since I'm a wireless person and an entrepreneur and a venture capitalist, I pretty much expect you entrepreneurs to be on your mobile device right now because it's, it's completely inconceivable that listening to me is the most important thing you have to do right now. So, so be completely free to do that. This uh, mic is really good. There, how about that? Um, anyway, happy to be back. Um, uh, last year I was asked to sort of comment on what I've seen that's changed locally and globally and I took some notes. I don't have any slides because this actually came together and I wanted to be here to, um, to be able to assess what I'd seen change locally. Um, a lot of you asked and those of you that didn't hear before were wondering why on earth I would be here. And as mentioned, um, uh, I'm an investor now and I was in the wireless business. Luckily, the company that I co-founded, Nextel, had some very um, strong metrics and a lot of company, uh, countries wanted to replicate our business. That took me to building companies in Latin America, some in Southeast Asia, deals in Saudi. But I did come to uh, Pakistan a number of times, 15 plus years ago, mostly Islamabad, Karachi. People didn't feel so good about me being here. A lot of duck your head down below the window of the car talk. And, um, uh, but, but I enjoyed it even then. Um, so fast forward 15 years, why did I come back, I guess, was often asked question. And as an investor who sees companies globally, we were exposed to an enormous number of Pakistanis in the US, at conferences in London, in the Middle East, you name it, Singapore, really talented people, people with great ideas, people with great tech uh, talent, brilliantly educated and very global. And so we knew that the, the pool of talent was rich. Um, then there was a, an event that young Akash, who's sitting right in front of me, will remember me talking about last year. Several years ago, I was speaking at Startup Istanbul in, in um, Turkey, and it was right after they had blown up a bunch of Western tourists in Taksim Square, so I was the only American there. And as a result, a room of 3,000 people all wanted to talk to me. That sounds like I'm being jerky, but it, you know, it's just because I was the American there. And in that crowd, and I must have talked to 400 people before the, the CEO of Turkcell, who was my next real meeting, came and extracted me with a couple of his bodyguards, one person got through to me. And that one person sent me an email about a year and a half ago saying, Chris, you won't possibly remember me, but, but I, I told you about uh, this new uh, Nest organization we were starting in Karachi, and um, I hope you'd consider coming and speaking with us, and we've had this many companies and that. And remarkably, I remembered right away it was a very compelling couple of minute pitch. So if any of you ever want to learn how to pitch quickly and, and determinedly to um, a VC, talk to Akash. Because, yeah, exactly. Now, the third reason I came um, last year was because we were investors in Kareem. And Mudasser, who's the CEO, who you guys will get to hear soon, um, also encouraged me to come. And I, I can't say that that didn't have an influence. It did. Um, but I'll get back to him a little later. So what's changed? Well, last year, I didn't know anything about Waffle Witch or Ice Pop. So 
these are really important uh, movements in this market. And while I feel sick to my stomach, it was incredibly satisfying going down. And so those are, you're all lucky if you can try those um, products. But, but more important, you have um, funds like Samayakar. They, last year they were making announcements. This year they're making investments and good investments. And I've been on phone calls with them during the year and, and it's just so impressive to see that. You have the uh, Fatima team. They've, they've partnered with Gobi. Last year they were trying to figure out how to structure. This year they have a partnership with a great fund and, and are actively investing. Um, you have, who else do you have? You have Atif, who left San Francisco. And now you have Indus Valley Capital. And I'm sure you all saw him yesterday. What a great cheerleader for this ecosystem, and deservedly so. Um, more sort of numbers-wise, deal flow. We, we keep track of all of our um, inbound deals. And when I look at the last six months, I thought that would be a useful target. More deals from this simple country, not, not the region, just Pakistan, than we have in our entire database. So six months has caught up with the entire database. That's, that's impressive. The entrepreneurs, I think, are, are learning also. Part of one of the speeches I gave last year, and I don't know if, if those of you who have heard me before I know are really sick of me because they had this horrible program last year where I gave a keynote and then I gave a panel and then you all were given the opportunity to vote on who you wanted to speak again. So, lucky me, I got to speak again. So, uh, those, I apologize where this is repetitive, but the, the entrepreneurs did, I think, take some of my messages to heart. And the, the solidity of their business plans, the focus on data-driven decision-making, the amount of money that they've actually raised, and the amount of revenue that they're generating is really impressive now. I mean, it is, it is a sea change from last year, and, and I think that is, it is just amazing. Um, what hasn't changed? One thing about the entrepreneurs, and I just had another frustrating experience out in the hall. It's okay to share dollars and cents. This is why a venture capitalist would be talking to you. No other reason, sorry, I'm sure you're all fun and great, but, and, and I'm not, so you wouldn't want to be talking to me unless you wanted to talk about dollars and cents. Yet every time I say, what's your revenue? Well, we just launched about two months ago and we don't really have a final product. And just answer the question, if it's a dollar, if it's zero, if it's a million, if it's 10 million, it doesn't matter, it just helps me focus it. It's not a judgment, it's simply a fact and a data point that I need immediately, immediately. And, and the same goes with all these other numbers questions. It kind of, it's, when it's dollars and cents, it's awkward. Well, how much are you raising? Well, there's a whole spin around it. Just tell me how much you want to raise. You know, how much have you raised? Well, there's a whole spin around it. Get to the numbers. That's one thing that I would implore you to do as entrepreneurs. And the reason, particularly when it comes to global investors, is that we see entrepreneurs around the world. And so we have the opportunity to see them in the most refined ecosystems that exist. And people don't hide the numbers there. So when you're trying to convince somebody like me to invest in a far off market, albeit with great food and wonderful people, you, you don't want to make me think you're gonna obfuscate everything. You want to make me think you're going to tell me the numbers right up front, quick and easy. Because otherwise, I'm going to go, why would I do all that hard work and have problem extracting the data? So just something for the entrepreneurs again. Another thing that seems a bit problematic still is the intersection between the entrepreneurs and the investors. I'm still hearing investors say, you know, crazy hairy cap tables, and I know you all would think in this, in this instance, while I love hairy, wish I were, um, hairy means bad, bad cap tables. So, so hairy cap tables, and then the, the entrepreneurs telling me things like they're getting term sheets where, where the series seed or early stage investor wants 30, 40, 50, 60% of the company 
for a couple hundred thousand dollars. That's not a win-win. That is not the way that VC ecosystems get built. So that really should change. The other thing that was a little problematic, at the investor roundtable yesterday, the bureaucracy seems to still be very problematic here. What was positive was the articulation of the problems was brilliant yesterday. Unfortunately, I finally got it, and it scared me to death about investing here. But, but it really does need to change if you want to add um, global investors. Um, of course, I think it's very sad the number of Americans that are here. Um, I know one other somewhere in the audience is Matt, uh, I hope, but I brought him, so that doesn't count. And, and I don't really see a whole lot of other um, new ones. Now back to my friend Mudasser. I think I see him sitting there. I, I'm going to ignore him. But, but those of you who were here last year may have heard in one of my panels, or maybe all three I might have mentioned it, that in spite of me um, agreeing to come after he pleaded that it's his hometown and he pleaded that I'm an investor and he told me he was coming, I came and he didn't come. And um, not that I really cared, but of course it gave me an opportunity to give him grief. And so I told the crowd that he was dead to me and I gave one giant caveat which was if anybody in the audience had any dirt on Mudasser from childhood or love life or anything like that, I would find that worth talking to him just to give him that grief. And luckily, thankfully, I promised anonymity, so I won't call you out. A few of you did um, come through. So I'm going to tell you a couple of stories. Uh, no, I'm not. I'm just kidding. Um, but it did put us back on good terms, which is a wonderful thing. So I was able to give him a little grief. He got a little embarrassed. He got a little, you know, upset. Who the heck would tell you those things? Um, and I had a ton of fun. So yay, win-win. Um, but the most important thing on, being, uh, on speaking terms with Madas is that I could congratulate him on what really has been a brilliant exit. And that is the biggest change of all for this ecosystem because while it's a multi-country exit, you have your champion in your midst and everybody in Silicon Valley asks me, how the heck did you find Cream? Who the heck is running Cream? So it is going to change everything. So we should just give them a round of applause. Hmm. Running out of time. Uh, so now the big topic, which is the global landscape. I'm gonna run through this um, and just kind of cover things as we see it from a US investor that does global investing. Let's start with the biggest, China. Um, hard to ignore the slowing economy, hard to ignore some of the big foot faults on valuation, um, but also hard to ignore how they are expanding their influence and they remain a critical and incredibly powerful point of innovation in the world, so nobody should ignore them in spite of a few downturns. India, similar, much smaller scale, maybe not as much global relevance, but, but of course growing um, importantly. Uh, Southeast Asia, interesting. We are being approached by more VCs than ever before. That tells me that there is probably an overabundance of venture capitalists versus the deals because that's an unusual dynamic and, and there's nothing wrong with that by the way it's very difficult to get the balancing right but um, it's, um, it's, it's just sort of where I see that going. We have a few good deals, their valuations continue to move nicely and, and traction, smartphone penetration, all the right things are growing. Middle East, uh, I know we had uh, Shane here, we have some other folks from here. Um, it's an interesting situation because you've finally seen the, the convergence of several countries with their significant oil-based sovereign funds putting actual capital to work under the goal of shifting to a mind-based economy from a resource-based economy. 
And, and what that means is there is now and there will be for sure too much capital for the number of deals there. Again, it's hard to, to say that uh, that's bad for the ecosystem overall. And in fact, for the venture capital ecosystem, I think it's a super positive thing. Because what it's going to do is force the venture capitalists not to compete for their money, which has a negative impact on pricing and gives them too much leverage if they're the only money, but to compete on their value add. That's the way it works in Silicon Valley now. People go to certain firms for certain things, not just the money, because the best deals have way more money offered to them than they have the ability to take. So that's going to be a really positive thing um, over time in, in MENA. And I know that that's a very close market, so you should, you should watch it. Um, LATAM. We invest there. They've had a real uptick in spite of, in the tech sector, in spite of the really terrible, individually bad economies and geopolitical situations in the countries. They also had the benefit of a nice um, fairy dust sprinkling from SoftBank's announcement of a $5 billion fund uh, being run by Marcelo, who is one of their key folks and is, is uh, a Latino. Problematic perhaps now, because that fund was on their balance sheet, not a group of LPs, and he is off running WeWorks. So that could dissipate and, and really crater those markets. I'm, I'm a, probably most worried about that one. Um, brings us to the US. Oh, time's up. Well, I'm just going to give you the US. So um, that same vision fund strategy, the SoftBank thing, is having an incredible influence. I can't have a conversation there without somebody asking me about it. And I think it, it is something that you can put in a box and say, look, you have, you have a number of companies where technology was enabling basic revenue growth businesses, it wasn't disrupting them. And so there was an emphasis on that huge top line growth without an emphasis on underlying innovation. And those stories are bad. Um, but what really I think is, is the big call out there, and this will ultimately be good for venture, is that the, the pattern of mega funds raising fund after fund every couple, two, three years is exposed that, that for them, it's easier to mark up and keep your portfolio alive in your first fund by spending another 20 or 30 million that you may never get back than suffering the inability to raise your second billion dollar fund and all the fees associated with it. So the economics become very clear that the big funds are conflicted. And I think that exposure, that transparency is really going to be positive in the long run because ultimately there is a lot of innovation. The innovation has value. And where you can find this marriage of funders and founders a win-win, you're, you're still going to have a, a vibrant ecosystem. So that, those are my comments. I'm not going to get to take questions, but you know I'm outside. So thank you very much.